Uh, let's let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for that gift of faith that you have graciously bestowed upon us. Help us to cherish that faith and I'll always look to you as the source of all good gifts. Lord, help us to uh, keep our minds focused on your word, especially during this time and Bible study, so that uh, we may continue to uh, have more confidence in all the promises you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, we are in Isaiah, and we are in the section of the Lord is going to be using Cyrus to bring back uh, his people from exile. And we, we talked a little bit about this last week. We'll be finishing up this section here. And in doing so, it's kind of interesting. It's something that we need to remember as Christians. No matter what's going on in the world, God is still in control. And if God can use anyone, including people who aren't necessarily part of his, uh, you could say, the children of Abraham, um, and the answer is yes. God will call and utilize who he wants to utilize, including somebody who maybe not didn't really believe in him, but that's okay. God can do whatever he wants to do. And even when we sit there and say, you know, there is no hope per se, it, the situation is impossible. We cannot be rescued. Do not forget about divine intervention. Think about Moses being called to bring the people out of Egypt. And now we have Cyrus uh, being called to bring the people of Israel, uh, Israel back from um, uh, exile. What, what do those people do when they were disappointed? What do they were, you know, there's false idols and everything. Uh, what do they do, keep making idols? That, that's a good question is, you know, if when things go bad, what do you do? Do you return to the Lord or not? And see, that's really the key thing, is when you return to the Lord, you are returning to the Lord. If you're not returning to the Lord and this idol fails, you just go look for another idol. You go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. We have various fads here uh, in the United States, and it's almost like then a fad. But you, your basic choice is, do you return to the Lord or not? If so if you're not returning to the Lord, you're just then continuing on to the next fad. But if you're returning to the Lord, you're like, I know this is my strength. Okay, but let's, um, let's get into uh, Isaiah here. Isaiah chapter uh, 45, beginning with verse 9. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Okay, so you got some rhetorical questions here that, uh, uh, you know, God is kind of asking. The, what's behind this question is, do we not understand God is the creator? And that God has created you with a purpose? And do we in turn then go back to God and saying, you know, you made a mistake, God. You, you screwed me up. You should have made me this way. You know, so one of the in illustrations I, I sometimes use in things like this is, what would happen if the coffee cup said to the maker, I really wanted to be a china cup? Well, oh well, too bad. This is the way you got made, okay? Uh, so after we are born, uh, we may have some questions. How do we fit into this grand scheme of God? And what are, what's my purpose here? And whenever we have thoughts like this, we should go back to God's word. Because God's word will give us that, that guidance. And we look to simple things like the Ten Commandments. Like in the Ten Commandments, can God then say, hey, Here's how you are to be in relationship with me. Here's how you are to be in relationship with other people. And so the answer is yes. So as we unpack this verse, I have the highlighted section. 
Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? The answer is no. So God creates us. And uh, we got to keep this in mind that um, especially when we want to challenge God per se, challenging God is never a good thing, okay? Uh, so we should just realize we are God's creation. And can we celebrate that? Okay, Hilda, I think I saw your hand. I just think, um, you know, I understand the, the, uh, what God is saying. He's the creator of all things. Right. And we don't judge the maker of creation. However, God knows our humanity. Mm -hmm. And he knows it especially when we're depressed. When we've lost oh, yeah. love, when we've lost our income and stuff. It, it is not uncommon to say, God, why have you done this to me? God, why has this happened? And I believe that God understands us individually and us as a people. And as much as we're not supposed to question him, uh, depending on how we're questioning him, how long it takes, I think God is a very understanding and forgiving God. And if we do it because of our situation is just so drastic, I believe that he understands. And you, I think you got to the exact same point where I think Isaiah is trying to lead the people to, is as you as you note, the various circumstances of life will call will sometimes uh, create uh, a why response within us, and that's one of the reasons I love the lament psalms because in the lament psalms, that's a certain category of psalms, uh, you, the psalmist is just pouring out his heart to God. Uh, but in the midst of all those lament psalms, when you kind of start reading through them as like a section, you're going to find, in, I think just about all of them, when you get to the end of that psalm, you still find the psalmist saying, but I realize you are my God. Because that's always the key. Hilda, and I think that's where you're bringing in that whole concept of forgiveness. God knows who we are. God knows our sinful human nature. And of course, he knows that we're going to be saying, okay, God, why is this happening? Or even, why did you make me this way? Okay, and God's saying, hey, I did. But God still says, you know, we still need to keep our faith and trust in him. So the, the lament psalms, I, again, I really, really cherish because they, the psalmist is pouring out his griefs, his concerns, and so forth, but he still has faith. Now, for the people of Israel during this time, you got to remember, as they're being put into exile, did they really have faith? Well, as uh, John was mentioning earlier about the whole concept with the idols, is, you know, if they're trusting in something else, that's a little bit different. So, um, we have to take those two approaches, one from uh, an idol point of view that says, I'm not even trusting in God, I'm trusting in these fake gods, so to speak, versus the Christian that sits there and says, okay, Lord, I'm really struggling here. Help me, because uh, I'm not understanding everything. Those are kind of a little bit two different type of paths because of the attitude of the heart. So when the heart believes and trusts in God, uh, it's, it's always good. Yes, we can have difficult days and have our cries and lament. But I think when we're in this passage of Isaiah, it's a little bit more than just uh, a believer having uh, like loss of job or you know uh, loss of a loved one or whatever, this is uh, in a different category of of the people of Israel not even recognizing who God is. I thought I saw a hand over my glasses this way. Was that right or not? Okay, that's the one problem with my quote unquote bifocals. I actually it's just single glasses, but. I can look down and I can read, but sometimes I'm not always looking up and seeing. So, okay, so let's let's uh, let me go on here a little bit more. Uh, so behind all of this is again that whole restoration here. Um, but in the midst of this restoration, let me just do a segue from the previous slide to this slide. Uh, God is setting up the people of Israel and saying, hey, I'm going to return you from Israel. I'm going to use Cyrus. Oh, and by the way, um, don't complain uh, that I didn't use you. I created Cyrus for a reason. 
So let's go on to this, and because this is uh, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him. <clears throat> Remember, this is a singular him, okay? Ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free. Not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so this is, uh, now we're getting to uh, uh, God's really kind of sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to raise up Cyrus, and he's going to do this. Um, he's the one that creates things, and he's the one that makes things happen. Um, he's, and so Cyrus is going to rebuild, or let the exiles rebuild. He's going to set... And I like the idea of my exiles. And again, the, what I like about that, that phrase is that possessiveness. God is saying, these are still my people. They have rebelled, okay? They have chased after false idols, okay? But God keeps his promises. They are still my people, okay? Uh, and then that last part is not for price or reward. What does that mean? Oh, I, I love this one. So thank you, John. Okay. Um, think, I want you to think of leaders in today's world. Okay. People who are in upper level positions. Do they ever do anything without any reward? You know, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, let's say our elected leaders. Okay. Sorry, Sorry my little bit of a judgmental attitude here. Okay. But now, huh? Huh? Well, yeah, we, you got some of them that say that they're not going to take salary, but at the same time, um, money is not the only thing that uh, is of value. There's also something called power, okay? And it, it can get really, really complicated. But what's going on here is that Cyrus is going to do this without any price, and there's going to be no reward, okay? Uh, there's really no benefit to Cyrus, Okay. I mean, if you think about it, go back to the, the uh, Egypt and go back to the people of Israel. Uh, why would Pharaoh let the people of Israel go? This was his workforce. Well, you're going to say, Pastor, he didn't do it willingly. You're right. He didn't do it willingly. Why? Because it, it does not make sense. You have hundreds of thousands of uh, free, quote unquote, uh, slave laborers, yes, you got to feed them, you got to take care of them, but you don't necessarily have to pay them, okay? And you're going to let them go, you're going to let this free labor force kind of like go, and then you're going to have to do the work yourself? The answer is it doesn't make sense. Finally, you know, after plague, after plague, after plague, finally, Pharaoh lets them go, but then after they're gone, guess what happens? There's a change of heart, and Pharaoh goes after them. So why would you let them go? Why would Cyrus let them go? And the answer is, God wanted it. And so the whole concept that a ruler is going to do this without price or reward, who's really doing it? God is. And so that's the, the key point here, is to say, you know, this isn't just some always oh, politically convenient type thing. Let's just go ahead and do this and I'll profit uh, in the end. No, Cyrus is going to be losing out. Why are you doing it? God wants it done. So again, for Christians, this gives us hope. Even in, you could say, the darkest moments, you're in exile, you're away from your homeland, you're probably lonely, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Sure, some people are feeling fairly comfortable in the land, but, you know, a lot of them are not. And, you know, you're kind of second-class citizens, if not slaves, you know, kind of like at this point. And why would Cyrus let them go home? And the answer is, it's not about Cyrus. It's about God. God is now saying, it's time to come home. Come on home. 
And so for us as Christians, whenever we see dark events or when we see something that seems to be impossible, there's no way we could ever get ourselves out of this one. You got to remember, it's not about you. It's about God. You might not have a way of getting out of it. Okay, fair enough. Then what should you do? You should be petitioning to the one who does make things happen, who does raise up people and accomplish his will. That's God Almighty. And again, it's a, it's a good teaching point for us as Christians in today's world, is we are so focused on ourselves sometimes that we lose sight that there's an Almighty God, he does have a will and purpose, and it's always better to follow the will of God than to oppose the will of God, hint, hint. Um, but when things don't make sense to us, we continue to put our faith and trust in God because we know it will accomplish God's will. This world is not spinning out of God's control. We may be thinking it's spinning out of control, but it's not spinning out of God's control. Any questions about that before I go on? Because it's going to be a new section. Um, yeah, Hilda? Just a lot of times things happen like after years and years and years. I mean, a lot of these people were hoping that God would save them out of this. Many people died in Egypt before they were rescued. Um, and so even though we're praying to God that something happens, it's always in God's timing. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I just think that a lot of times those, a lot of those people still remain very faithful that God would come through, even though if it wasn't in their lifetime, perhaps it would be in their ch children or their grandchildren's generation that God would come to save us. And so I think that even like now in these dark times, we have to believe that God loves his people and he will protect his people, but because we say, well, come down now. I mean, life is bad. We need you now. We have to remember that it's all in God's timing. Mean, he knows he has the perfect plan. He, has to put, he puts everything in place. And if he wanted to do it 24 hours, he could. But most of the time, there's a reason why he waits. And we have to trust him for that. The, the, that's always the hard part is can we just trust that God does have everything in control? And even if it doesn't make sense to us, it's still going to turn out to be good. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's go on to the next section. And this next section is kind of uh, entitled, uh, The Creator Saves, Not Idols. So again, it's getting back to that point where the people of Israel were trusting in idols, and God really wants them to understand idols will not save you. And we, we've been talking about idols for a while, and you might be thinking, Isaiah, when are you going to get off this idol soapbox? And the answer is, uh, when Christ comes again. Because as human beings, we're always going to be struggling with, you know, are we going to return to the Lord or not? Okay? And if we're not returning to the Lord, uh, then we're chasing after an idol. But the, let's go on here and uh, have a little bit of fun with this. Verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the, the Sabaeans, men of statue, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, surely God is in you. There is no other no God besides him. Okay, so what's happening here? You have the enemies, per se, okay, now being almost being brought as in chains or in, as servants to God's people. The enemies will then serve God's people of sorts. But I, I also like uh, what I didn't underline, I should have, should have, but right about here where it says, where the, these people who are in chains say, surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. So it's interesting that the enemy of the Lord will finally come to the realization who God is, okay? And then that, I still love that concept that God is in you. Do we not understand that God is in us, that and I should have put that as one of the, the references, that, but I, instead I went to the psalm here, uh, that your body is the temple of the Lord. 
okay? And, and so we're never alone. And we don't need to make idols. We don't need to chase after something else whenever we're feeling a little down and out. God is with us. But in uh, reference to this, uh, these verses, I actually brought in uh, the 23rd Psalm, that very well-known Psalm, uh, because uh, what's happening here in Isaiah is you have the enemies be returning back to uh, uh, the people uh, to the people of Israel uh, as slaves. And so what happens in the, the latter verses of Psalm 23, verse 5? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So here we have, as the psalmist says, the enemies. You prepare a table before, uh, for me in the presence of my enemies. So the enemies get to watch while you get to feast which is a little bit torturous, you could say. But, you know, if you're outside of God's grace, guess what? You have rejected God. So what, what Isaiah here is, what the people of Israel should be hearing from these words from Isaiah is, who's really in charge? That's God, okay? And that the enemies will be delivered into their hands because God will take care of it, but also that God is in you. So we really shouldn't be chasing after idols. But will we get this message? Okay. Isaiah then continues, verse 15. Truly, you are a God who hides himself. We'll talk about that in a second. O God of Israel, the Savior, all of them are to put shame and, uh, I'm sorry, all of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. Okay, so let's start with the first part as I have it uh, uh, underlined there. You are a God who hides himself. Okay, and you might be thinking, okay, what's going on here? Well, let's just sort of say that God uh, it reveals himself, yes, but how? Through his word and his sacraments. So I have the passage in there from Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 2. Um, Long ago at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So again, you've got that creation theme besides Hey, this is how God speaks. Oh, quick question, Jay. Are they aware of the Holy Spirit at that point? Are they aware of the Holy Spirit? Um, oh, God hides. Not true. Oh, oh, in connection with God hiding here. Okay. Um, th that's a good question if they had read their Bibles. Okay. If they had, would have read Genesis, first book of the Bible, if they would have gotten to, you know, the, the third verse, if I remember correctly, where it talks about the spirit of the Lord hovering over, uh, uh, they should know there's a spirit. However, you got to remember, you're dealing with people who were trusting in idols. So did they really know? Eh, probably not. Uh, or they forgot what they were taught in junior high confirmation class because it wasn't constantly being reviewed. Um, but does God hide himself is, is sometimes a question that people ask. And let's put it like this. God does not necessarily want to make things super obvious. So he's not going to, you know, put his, uh, like, throne up in the sky for everyone to see and go, oh, wow, okay, now we see the throne in the sky, uh, we better believe and trust in God. Instead, God chooses to speak and chooses to reveal himself through the prophets. Finally, through his son, Jesus, when God takes on flesh and blood. And we might struggle with this in saying, well, shouldn't God make it obvious? And the answer is, in God's infinite wisdom, he has not necessarily made it obvious. God will reveal himself the way that God wants to reveal himself. If you go back to Adam and Eve in the garden, 
they had that beautiful relationship with God. But, okay, was, did they not realize that God was always there? And then here comes Satan, and then they rebel, and then they try to hide from God? So I will admit, Scripture uh, reminds us that uh, we need to go where God promises to be. And whenever our hearts get a little down and out and we're thinking, okay, where is God? Well, where does God promise to be? He promises to be in his word and his sacraments, plain and simple. Um, does God sometimes back off a little bit as a little bit of testing to see, you know, what are we going to do? Almost like a, a child trying to, I'm sorry, a parent trying to teach that wandering child and sort of ducks behind the corner. And then when the child finally realizes that mom and dad isn't around, they start getting upset. With the message being, don't wander away too much. Yeah, yeah, stay close. Make sure you can see me. Make sure you can hear me. Don't go wandering off on your own because you might get lost. So yes, we have a God who does hide himself. And, but he also promises to say, don't worry, you know where I will be found. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be there. So it's not necessarily as a way of hiding to say, I'm going to abandon you and you're on your own. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a different type of hiding that says, yes, yeah, so there's going to be some times where it's not going to be so obvious. But you do know where to find me. Any questions about that? I, okay. Oh, let me start with Hilda and I'll go to John. I think um, God, maybe, because sometimes we all have a dry spell when we don't feel God, but I think He always calls us to relationship, and sometimes we have to work it, like you said, you know, scriptures, church, whatever, but the, in Scripture it also says, seek and you shall find. Not, and the door will be open to us. So it requires some action from us. He's not always going to provide us everything we need so that we know that he's right there. Sometimes it takes faith to know that even though we don't see him, he is there. And sometimes he requires a little work from us, more prayer time, you know, things like that. Scriptures that you shall find. There's a little bit of a nuance coming up in this weekend's uh, theme. Uh, which is, it's Good Shepherd Sunday. And you're right, Christ is that Good Shepherd. He is going to take care of us and so forth. Uh, but Jesus also knows, uh, says that, you know, he's the Good Shepherd, fair enough. But then the sheep should also know who he is and follow him. Okay? And I think that's kind of what you're getting at, is that, uh, is there, after we're in the body of Christ, is there things that we need to do? Uh, yeah, avoid the, the false idols, okay? Avoid sinning. And when God's word is presented, yes, be there. And like you also said, you know, we can read God's word, we can pray to God. Um, and it's, w w there are some things that, yes, we should be doing and some things we should be avoiding. Okay, John, I think you had a question. Uh, it's an old-fashioned thing, like two words to be human. But God invented one word. He, I'm sorry, he meant what? He meant one word, saved. Saved? Yes. Okay. Without that word, where would we be? Correct. Without God's grace, we would be doomed. Yes. Okay. And you're right. To, to err is to, hum, to be human because as humans, we, are, we have that sinful human nature. We can't do things perfectly. Uh, and God knows that. And so God does graciously uh, forgive. Uh, and there's actually another little nuance into all of this uh, with uh, getting back to Isaiah. Uh, in verse 16, it said, All of them are put to shame and confounded. The idol makers uh, go in confusion together. Okay, So that's one group. You have your idol makers, so to speak. But, 17, Israel is saved. Who's doing the work? By the Lord. With an everlasting salvation you shall not be put to shame or confounded. Now, it does qualify to all eternity. So there might be some times where we might be scratching our head. But again, the Christian knows where God is to be found. Wherever the marks of the church are God's word and sacrament. 
Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. Okay? And when God takes his word and promises and attaches it to physical elements like water, bread, and wine, at God's command, they accomplish what God designs it to do. So as Christians, we, we, we go and we gather where God promises to be. Okay, let's uh, go on to the next one. Verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in the land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth and declare what is right. Okay, so first of all, just as a, just as a reminder, God knows what his plan is. So he sends prophets to remind the people of Israel, okay, and to remind us that God knows what's going on. Even during the time of Moses, as he was leading the people of Israel, there was this time that, that Moses even said, you know, there's going to be a time where you're going to rebel, but God will bring you back, okay? So again, God has already, God knows our, our, our human nature, but he still loves us and forgives us. And notice at the end, it says, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right because the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ. He did make those promises and they are all fulfilled. And J Jesus himself says in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So as we live in a world that is constantly thinking, what's true? What are the real facts? The answer is, Let's just go back to God's word. Where is real truth and meaning in today's world? Back in what God has revealed to us. Any questions about that? Different interpretations of the Bible. I'm sorry, what? There are different interpretations of the Bible. Okay. Some's truth, somebody's truth is not necessarily somebody else's truth. I'm not too sure where you were going with that, sorry. It's just that we have different religions, different sectors. Right. One will say, well, this is God's word, this is the truth. And then somebody else will interpret oh, the same okay. scripture, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit different, but some wording has changed because throughout the ages, they change the wording to make it more palatable to the current generation. Right, 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 right. Does that person have to have authority? Explain what the word truth is. Yeah, okay, so no, I, I have a better idea where you're going with that. So you're right, we live in a world that is constantly, you know, grasping at what they think is truth. But as Christians who gather around God's word, we know that to be the truth. And yes, we live in a world where there are other religions, per se, okay, just like the idols were in the Old Testament. And they're saying, well, this is true for us. Well, Guess what? This is the absolute truth. This is revealed by God. Um, and so, you know, like the, the Pontius Pilate question, as uh, Jesus kind of speaks it and says, you know, he's, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And Pilate says, okay, what is truth? Pilate was following that worldview that says, I don't understand what truth is. And as Christians, we realize where the truth actually comes from. It comes from God and it's revealed to us in his word. So again, we always go back to that word uh, of God. But for those that were chasing after idols, obviously they're not going to be opening up their Bibles and saying, oh, that's the truth. And so part of it is, what do you really believe and trust? Do you believe that God has saved and delivered you? He has forgiven you all your sins? That's only going to be revealed to you through God's word. You don't believe in God, how do you know what the word truth means? I, I agree with you. But Paul does kind of mention in Romans that it's been also a little bit written into our hearts, that law of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. But don't worry, God, God will take care of it. Huh? That's where, where you say it's written in our hearts. Because not all generations can read, could read at that time, especially during the time of Moses. 
that the education, there wasn't the Torah was recited to them, and many of them memorized it, but it's not like they had, uh, you and I could just go to the store and buy a Bible or go down and get a right. Bible. So not everybody had the word, but they had the Spirit of God inside. They, yeah, they, the, it, yeah, there was like a very strong oral tradition, uh, but the promises of God uh, are still the promises of God. And remember, they were given to Abra, uh, starting even with uh, Adam and Eve, and then to the next generation, to the next generation. Uh, there's actually a book put out by uh, CPH uh, uh, that talked about the, uh, the ancient developers of the Chinese language actually would have embedded Genesis chapters 1 through 11 into how their characters and words were formed. Uh, and it was developed by a couple of missionaries as they were studying the Chinese language and so forth. And it's, so it's just interesting to see how God's word does uh, creep up into various aspects of uh, society. Um, uh, but uh, since we have, uh, we are blessed to have what we would call the Old and New Testament as the Bible, we hang on to that and we should be cherishing that um, because uh, uh, that is uh, God's revealed word to us and we have the witnesses who have written all this down for us and so we should be saying, okay, yes, Lord, we're going to hang on to this. Um, so, but it is a fascinating read. If you want to know more about that, let me know but uh, we can talk a little bit later. But let me uh, move on a little bit. Uh, verse 20. Uh, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it, I, was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. So God, again, is chastising those idol makers and those people who are following the idols. Uh, and basically God is saying, didn't I tell you this before? Uh, and I know we don't like to hear that, you know, that, that phrase in today's world, I told you so. But guess what? God is basically saying, I told you so. I knew this was going to happen, okay? And I even told you that it was going to happen. Because who is in control of all things? Uh, that's God, okay? And so he says, who declared it of old? But the, the beautiful part of this is the last few words, that, uh, how God describes himself. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. Yes. I mean, if you take a look at world religions, what religion sits there and says God is going to take on flesh and blood and give himself up for you because you cannot save yourself. All the other religions of the world teach or talk about how you have to do something to gain God's favor. It's only Christianity that basically God says, you can't gain my favor because you guys are screwed up. You're, you're sinners. You have rebelled. I'm going to have to do it for you. So it puts Christianity in such a different category that I, I am sometimes amazed with, you know, the pilot type question, what is truth? It's just like, well, Christianity is a, one, one of a bunch of religions, and the answer is no, we are nowhere near anything else. It is a completely different viewpoint. Here God comes and saves and delivers us versus you got to do something uh, to save yourself. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, really interesting, but notice that this is even being named here in Isaiah. I'm a righteous God, a Savior, and then just clarify, there's none besides me. Christianity is in a completely different arena because no other religion has a God who says, I will come and save and deliver you because there is no other God. There's only one God. 
The rest are all made man-made. Okay, let's go on. Verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all at the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Now that last phrase may sound familiar. Okay, it's used a couple times, and I grab one of the New Testament references from Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. Uh, Paul writes, so that at the, same, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen, amen. Uh, but let me uh, back up a little bit, uh, because when the people of Israel would have heard this, Okay, I'm hoping it would have shaken them a little bit because of the key words, for I am God, you know, that great I am concept that should have just tweaked their ears and saying, oh yeah, yeah, this is the God that delivered us out of Egypt, okay? Uh, and yes, uh, it is about God's righteous word, his word that does not return empty. But by the way, to me, every knee shall bow. Yeah, every tongue confess. So God's word is indeed powerful. Uh, let's, let me finish up this section here. Verse 24, only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength to him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord, all, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. So basically, God is saying that salvation is only through him. There is salvation in nowhere else. If you put your trust in other things, you will be put ashamed. But in the end, when Christ comes again, that's it. Okay, is there a difference? No, there's no difference. Okay. Well, to the Jews, it, it, there's a difference, not to us. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, from salvation and being saved, uh, yes, uh, uh, we are saved and Christ is our salvation, yes. Uh, but let me, I think I can grab the next section. It's just seven verses. But um, I like how the study Bible then phrases this, this uh, outline, in the outline. The Lord carries Israel. Babylon carries its idols. Oh, and I love that illustration. The Lord carries Israel. And because who's doing the work? God's doing the work. Does God carry us? Yes. Okay, we're not alone. Okay, we're not, you know by ourselves. God is the one providing for us. God is the one carrying us. God is the one redeeming us. Okay? Uh, but if you want to talk about you doing th something, that you're carrying your share, your load, be careful of the ending part of that line. Babylon carries its idols. If you're thinking you're, gonna, you're doing it, guess what? It's an idol. Okay, I just thought that was a beautiful insight from that uh, title there. But let's go into uh, Isaiah 46, uh, 1 through 2. Uh, Bel, and that is um, a name of one of the Babylonian gods. Uh, uh, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops, their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together, they cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Okay, so, uh, you know, God is actually now naming just some of the, uh, the chief uh, Babylon uh, gods, per se. Um, and, you know, the, the gods were, you know, the, these idols for, you know, to be carried in possession. Remember, I said Christianity is a done religion. Christ does it for you. Other religions, you have to do something. And so that's where that burden comes in. These things you carry, these idols you carry, it's a burden. They're telling you, you got to go do this, you got to go do that, you got to accomplish this task or that task. 
they can't save you. Okay. But then I throw in an interesting note, and we're just going to have a little bit of fun with it. From 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 21. And the Philistines left their idols there, after they kind of got uh, beat here, and David and his men carried them away. So there's a couple of interesting nuances here. Uh, this was before... Um, uh, Anyway, first of all, let me just ask the question is, would you ever abandon an idol? Not if it was important to you. Not if it was important to you. Right, right. So let me put it this way. Would you ever abandon God? No. The answer is no. Okay. Even if your life depended on it? Well, that's what we say in our confirmation vows. Okay. That we, won't, we will hang on to the Lord, even if my life depends on it. Well, guess what the Philistines didn't do? Okay. They apparently gave up their idols and ran away. And David and his men, and you're like, well, why would they want to collect the idols? Well, the idols might have been gold, silver. They might have been collecting them as spoils of war, per se. But you might, some people might think, well, couldn't those idols maybe have swayed some of the, the people? And maybe they would have uh, adored them and the answer is, well, I guess that could have happened. Happened during Moses' time. Right. Yeah. But uh, the, the key thing is I, I'm thinking this is more spoils of war, more of the money thing. Um, but even if you go down that path that says, shouldn't we just stay clear of the idols per se? Ooh, then you get into a little bit of a sticky situation because... The gold, if it was made into an idol, can't you not re-melt the gold and sell it off? Yeah, the answer is yes. So, I mean, it can be a spoil of war. We do have to be careful that we don't put our faith and trust in idols, that we just put our faith and trust in God. Um, but also keep in mind that, you know, um, even in our Old Testament, our, our matriarchs and our patriarchs of the Old Testament, were they perfect people? Was David perfect? The answer is no. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, we are reminded that the people of the Old Testament and New Testament are just like us. Sinful human people that sometimes struggle, sometimes fail. Sometimes we do listen to the Lord and the Lord accomplishes the good things through us. Uh, but uh, so, so I just wanted to toss that out there just because I just thought it was interesting that the Philistines then left the idols. And David and his men said, hey, spoils of war, let's pick them up. What was the historical significance of that particular sentence? Oh, from verse 21? Yes. Is that, the, is that after something happened? The war. Well, after they lost, yeah. That was the war. I mean, there was always different battles. That was a war, right? It was a battle, yeah. They were running away, right? Okay, but let, let's. Uh, uh, I got just a couple more slides here. Uh, verse three. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am He, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, and I will carry, and will save. Oh, love this beautiful, dripping gospel here, okay? That God says, I'm going to be carrying you. I, I'm the one that's, I bore you. And by the way, I love that. It says, who have, who have been, okay, let me just reread this. All the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth. Yeah, God has said, guess what? Before you were born, guess what? I already claimed you, okay? Uh, carried you from the womb. I have taken care of you, and I will continue to take care of you, even to your old age, even to the gray hairs. And I'm kind of like, yeah, more of my gray hair is coming through. But don't worry, Pastor Bala. God is still taking care of you. So when you see that gray hair coming through, you just have to be reminded of this Bible passage that God is still caring for you. Uh, I, will make, I have made you, I will bear, I will carry, and save. Notice God is doing all this work. He, that's why we talk about Christianity being a done religion. 
So get rid of the idols. They are just burdens and cast all your burdens upon the Lord. His yoke is easy, Jesus says. Okay, verse 5, and we'll close with this. This will be the last slide for today. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god, and they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders, they carry it, they set it on its place, and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. So God kind of closes off this section and says, why are you comparing me to idols? Okay, they don't do anything for you. They don't save you. They don't carry you. They don't give you strength. Who is the one that created you? Who's the one that carries you each and every day? Who's the one that loves you and forgives you? And so God is just making his case. Get rid of those idols. So next week, uh, we will then... Sorry, I just love this uh, title here. The Lord's Message to Stubborn Babylon. I like that word stubborn. It reminds me of us Lutherans from time to time. We can be a little stubborn from time to time. Welcome to our sinful human nature. So that'll be uh, next week. We will continue on uh, with that. But uh, let's uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.